Hello, thank you for joining me. My name is Juliana and welcome to my channel. And I'd like to start by saying that although the topic of this video is poetry, I'm talking about it from the perspective of linguistics. So the idea of this video is not to help you write better metaphors or anything like that, though I suppose that it could help with that and with poetry interpretation. However, the topic of this video is a theory within cognitive linguistics. As always, there are timestamps and references in the description box below. Does the road wind uphill all the way? Yes, to the very end. Will the day's journey take the whole long day? From morn to night, my friend. But is there for the night a resting place? A roof for when the slow, dark hours begin. May not the darkness hide it from my face? You cannot miss that inn. Shall I meet other wayfarers at night? Those who have gone before. Then must I knock or call when just in sight? They will not keep you standing at that door. Shall I find comfort, travel sore and weak? Of labor you shall find the sum. Will there be beds for me and all who seek? Yea, beds for all who come. Now, if I ask you what this poem is about, you'll probably be able to say that it's about life and death, and not just a story about two friends walking uphill to find an inn or something like that. We know that there is a deeper meaning to it. But how can we figure that out when the words life and death are nowhere to be found in the poem? That's because we are all used to this imagery of us going through life as travelers on a road and the imagery of death being rest or sleep. According to conceptual metaphor theory, that's because we all share these common metaphors that life is a journey and death is rest or death is sleep. But what is conceptual metaphor? Well, I've already explained it in an earlier video, I'm going to link the card up here. The basic idea is that metaphors are not simply figures of speech, but they actually reflect a mode of thought, which is based on our concrete, embodied experience, in our sensory perceptions. And metaphors are not just present in poetry, in literature, but actually they are present in our everyday language. and. Most of the time, we don't even notice that we are using metaphors. For instance, we talk about time metaphorically, because we talk about time as if it were money. That's why we say things like save time, spend time, waste time. So it seems that we understand more abstract concepts, such as time and life, through more concrete concepts, such as money and a journey. Another example. Uh, normally, we talk about affection in terms of warmth. When someone is affectionate, we say that they are warm. And when someone is more aloof, we say that they are cold. So, these are conceptual metaphors based on our sensory perceptions. Some other common conceptual metaphors for life and death which show up a lot in poetry and in some of the examples that we're going to see in this video are a lifetime is a day, a lifetime is a year, life is a precious possession, death is night, death is departure, people are plants. That's why we say things such as, oh, that person is blossoming, or, oh, that person is a late bloomer. In the literature of conceptual metaphor theory, a very famous example of the life is a journey metaphor is the poem The Road Not Taken by Robert Frost. I'm just going to read some excerpts from it, I'm not gonna read the whole thing. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both, and be one traveler long I stood. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. So this poem talks about decisions in life through this image of life being a road. And here we have another common conceptual metaphor when he talks about wood. The idea here is that he cannot see ahead, so it's difficult to make a decision. And so we have the conceptual metaphor here that 
Knowing is seeing. You can see, you don't know. A very famous example of the death is sleep metaphor is of course Hamlet's soliloquy. Sol soliloquy. To die, to sleep, to sleep, perchance to dream, you know the one. Many people ask, well, is there a difference between linguistic metaphors and conceptual metaphors? Well, according to this theory, the linguistic metaphors are actually a reflection of the conceptual metaphors in our minds. So when we use words from the domain of journey to talk about life or from the domain of money to talk about time, these are metaphorical linguistic expressions, they are linguistic metaphors, but at the same time they reflect the conceptual metaphors that come first. So the metaphors are not in the language, they are in our minds. Traditionally, metaphors were thought to be in the language only. They were thought of as figures of speech and people used to think that uh, metaphors were invented by the poets, by the writers, and that you needed a special talent to create metaphors. But how would we all be able to understand the metaphors then if they were in the poet's head and not based on ideas that we all already share? So conceptual metaphor theory says that there are basic or primary metaphors that we all share and that seem to be most of them found across different languages and cultures because they are based on our, uh, on our sensory perceptions, as I said before, on our concrete experience. So the talent and the originality of the poets is actually not in inventing, creating new metaphors, but rather in manipulating these metaphors that we all share already. Their creativity is in elaborating on or extending the metaphors or combining different conceptual metaphors in complex ways. Of course, writers can create new metaphors, but then these novel metaphors will stand out and their meaning won't be immediately retrievable. So here is an example from the novel Love in the Time of Cholera by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. And here the character talks about uh, the tea tasting like window. So the tea tastes like window, that's a metaphor, but I'm not sure what it means. It's not so easy for us to get it. But how do poets do it? How do they create new images based on these conventional metaphors? According to some scholars, there are some devices that poets use. Let's have a look at them. So the first device is extending. So extension is when the poets add new elements to the existing conceptual metaphor. For example, in that poem by Robert Frost that we saw, the new element is in the fact that there are two roads and the idea that one of the roads is less traveled than the other. So this is extending on the idea that life is a journey or a road. In the Divine Comedy, Dante says, In the middle of life's road, I found myself in a dark wood. That's also an extension. The new element here is the idea that the journey of life passes through a dark wood. Another device is elaboration. Elaboration is different from extension in that it elaborates on an existing element of the metaphor instead of adding new elements. So the poet elaborates on an existing element in an unusual way. Let's see an example from a poem called The Phenomenology of Anger by Adrian Rich. And again, this is just a passage, not the whole poem. When I dream of meeting the enemy, this is my dream. White acetylene ripples from my body, effortlessly released, perfectly trained on the true enemy, raking his body down to the thread of existence. Now this is using a conventional metaphor, which is anger is a hot fluid in a container. That's why we say things such as boiling with anger or this makes my blood boil. But in Rich's poem, the hot fluid is elaborated as acetylene specifically. And instead of an explosion of anger, as we normally say, she talks about directing the anger at the target. So there was no addition of a new element, but an elaboration of an existing element of that metaphor. Another device is questioning. 
That's when poets question the appropriateness of the everyday metaphors themselves. Here is an example from Catullus. Suns can set and return again, but when our brief light goes out, there is one perpetual night to be slept through. So, as I said earlier, some of our most common conceptual metaphors for life and death are a lifetime is a day and death is night. But here, the poet is saying, well, but when we die, we don't come back like, you know, a day comes back after night. So he's questioning the appropriateness of these common metaphors. Another device is combining. So when poets combine different metaphors and that's considered the most powerful device. A classic example is Shakespeare's sonnet 73. Let's have a look at the first two quatrains of that sonnet. That time of year thou mayst in me behold, when yellow leaves are none or few do hang upon those boughs which shake against the cold, bare ruined choirs where late the sweet birds sang. In me thou seest the twilight of such day, as after sunset fadeth in the west, which by and by black night doth take away, that second self that seals a pollen rest. So just in this first two quatrains here, we already have the combination of at least four or five metaphors. So that time of year thou mayst in me behold. So here we have the metaphor that a lifetime is a year. And right after that, we have the metaphor that people are plants because he's using the image of yellow leaves or none, so of autumn and winter to talk about old age. Then the second quatrain starts with In me thou seest the twilight of such day. So now a lifetime is a day. As after sunset fadeth in the west, which by and by black night uh, doth take away. So what does the black night take away? The light. And life is light. So that's another metaphor. The black night takes away life. So another metaphor here, as we mentioned before, is that life is a precious possession. And if death takes away life, then we are talking about death as if it were an agent. So here we have the personification of death. And personification is also a very common device that poets use. It's very common to see death and time personified. For example, here in this sonnet by Milton, we have the personification of time as a thief. And this is connected to the metaphor that life is a precious possession. And in this other example from Shakespeare, we have time being personified as a reaper. And again, this is connected to the metaphor that people are plants. Lockoff and Turner suggest that this has to do with a more generic level metaphor, that events are actions. But then if events are actions, they need an agent. So that's how we end up personifying these things. Of course, as I said in the beginning, this is not just about analyzing poetry, but this is a theory within linguistics. So you might be wondering, well, that sounds legit, but is there any research, as in empirical research, any empirical evidence for that? And in fact, there is, but I think this would be a whole other video. So let me know in the comments below if you would like a video on that. This video is part of a sort of a series on my channel about cognitive linguistics, but it could also be the first on a series about linguistics and literature. So let me know in the comments as well if you like this topic and if you would like to see more videos on the intersection of linguistics and literature. Comments are highly appreciated to help me plan content for my channel, so feel free to tell me which topics within linguistics you would like to see more videos on. And if you've made it to the end of this video, thank you so very much for watching and don't forget to like, share and subscribe and I'll see you in the next video. Bye!